you would think that would be the end of it, um, but <laughs> it was not. Um, after Casey Kasem died, his body was given to his wife, Jean, even though Terry was both his conservator and his healthcare agent. So that's weird. Terry obtained a temporary restraining order to prevent Jean from cremating his body. Terry believed that Casey wanted to be buried in Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale, which is a famous cemetery. When she showed up with her restraining order at the funeral home, she was told that Jean had already moved the body to Montreal, so now out of the country. And apparently she wasn't able to do anything about that because six months later, in December 2014, Jean buried him in Oslo, Norway. So very clandestine, chaotic situation. Welcome to Absolute Trust Talk with your host, Kirsten Howe. Absolute Trust Talk brings you tips, tools, advice, and interviews to help you build a reliable knowledge base on estate planning, business, and finance to start preparing for your future today. One of the things we see a lot in blended families is that things can seem fine. Everybody seems like they're getting along the one big happy family until something happens to the parent who is holding the whole thing together. Yeah, we see a lot blended families, particularly where, you know, either one spouse dies that had children from a prior relationship or the second spouse passes away. And now the kids and the stepkids are all, you know, trying to figure everything out. So it can be very convoluted. You know, we try to make things a little bit easier, but the case we're talking about today is a little different. Because in this case, the dispute began before anybody even died. Right. The dispute in this case that we're going to talk about today involving the parent, Casey Kasem, his children from his first marriage and his wife, Jean, was about the dispute was about his medical care and who was supposed to be making decisions for him. And there's some new legislation in California that became effective just this year that might have changed the outcome for this family in some ways. And we have written about this legislation, but we thought it'd be interesting to talk about it on the podcast together with this Casey Kasem case. So hello, everyone, and welcome to Absolute Trust Talk. I'm Kirsten Howe. I'm here with Madison Gunn, and we're very glad to have you here today as we launch into a discussion about the Casey Kasem case. First, we're going to lay out the facts that are relevant for our conversation today. And then we're gonna discuss, as I said, the new legislation. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about how this new legislation might've been applied to that case if it happened today. Madison, you wanna start walking us through the facts? Yeah, so Casey Kasem, for anybody younger than me as a geriatric millennial, I'll just assume everybody my age roller knows who Casey Kasem is. Um, But he was an actor, a disc jockey, best known for his syndicated radio countdown show, American Top 40. He also played Shaggy and Scooby-Doo for all of us Saturday morning cartoonists. Uh, He had three children from his first marriage, Michael, Julie, and Carrie. And he had been married to his second wife, Jean, since 1980. So it wasn't like, you know, a quick new young marriage. Um, And they actually had a daughter together named Liberty. Right. Okay. So they had been married since 1980. The story that we're focused on starts in 2013. So 33 years married. One of Casey's older daughters in in 2013 announced to the public that Casey had been diagnosed with Parkinson's about six years earlier. Later, they changed that to Lewy body dementia, not Parkinson's. Those two illnesses can look similar, especially in the early phases. It's not That's clear. What to Robin Williams. Right, exactly. Was, that was the same scenario. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not really clear, at least to me, from what we've been able to find out about what the family situation was like before 2013. Were they all getting along? Was there a lot of uh, anger, hostility, suspicion? I don't know. But what we do know is that in 2013, his three older children started complaining that Jean, the wife, was keeping them away from Casey. She was not allowing them to see their dad. And things escalated to the point that one of the daughters, Julie, actually petitioned the court to be appointed his conservator. That petition was denied in November of 2013. And it's important to note that this is only regarding health care. They're not fighting over dad's money. They're not trying to be conservator over dad's money or estate. 
So it's just about healthcare decisions and the power to grant visitation. And the timing gets a little weird and interesting. In May 2014, Casey's other daughter, Carrie, was granted a temporary conservatorship over him. And that temporary conservatorship is usually the first step, like it's an immediate. You have to prove all these facts to show that it's an emergency, essentially, before a permanent conservatorship is granted. And they could be granted, they're, like I said, emergency very quickly without all the traditional process required for a permanent conservatorship. So they could be done on pretty short notice. You still have to notice everybody, but the timing is not as long. Really so they don't, people don't yeah. have as much time to respond. So Carrie got her temporary conservatorship granted May 12th, 2014. But the stepmom or Casey's wife had already, Jean, had checked Casey out of a nursing home he was living in in Santa Monica on May 7th. So the petition might have been a response to her taking him out of the skilled nursing facility. Um, and it was reported that she just unhooked him from his machines and drove him away in an SUV in the middle of the night. At like at 2 a.m., get him out. So in opposing the conservatorship, Jean had said that Casey was out of the country, presumably so the court wouldn't have jurisdiction over him. It's basically, she lied to the court as to the whereabouts of her spouse. And the, this caused the judge to order an investigation, and they found him in Washington State in a hospital, um, and the judge ordered Jean to give Carrie his passport so she couldn't get him out of the country. And there is evidence that Jean had moved him around quite a bit, to Nevada, back to California, finally to Washington, and in her car, not in an ambulance or an air ambulance or any type of medical transportation. And he should have been in a skilled nursing facility. They ended up finding him in a friend's house in the state of Washington. Right. So then they have located him. And in June, the court appointed attorney reported back on his status to the judge here in California. He apparently was not doing very well. He had an infection due to bed sores, which we don't know how that came about, but, you know, possibly driving around in a car for several weeks it doesn't as sound opposed good. to being in a skilled <laughs> nursing facility could have exacerbated that. And uh, Jean, in her presentation to the court at that time, said that Casey had not received any nutrition or hydration for an entire weekend. That was Carrie's decision as his conservator. She had been appointed conservator, so you know all the care decisions now fall on her. And she explained to the judge, well, the judge ordered nutrition and hydration, but then Carrie explained to the judge I did that on doctor's orders and also in keeping with my father's previously expressed wishes, you know, that I don't want artificial nutrition. I don't want that. If I'm about to die, don't do that. Um, so then the judge rescinded that and allowed her to put him on hospice care over Jean's objection. She did not want him on hospice care. And then he ended up dying just a few days later, June 15th, 2014. And you would think that would be the end of it, um, but it was not. Um, after Casey Kaysen died, his body was given to his wife, Jean, even though Carrie was both his conservator and his healthcare agent. So that's weird. Carrie obtained a temporary restraining order to prevent Jean from cremating his body. Carrie believed that Casey wanted to be buried in Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale, which is a famous cemetery. When she showed up with her restraining order at the funeral home, she was told that Jean had already moved the body to Montreal, so now out of the country. And apparently, she wasn't able to do anything about that because six months later, in December 2014, Jean buried him in Oslo, Norway. So very clandestine, chaotic situation. Right. And just for the record, Jean is Norwegian. I think she was born in Norway. It wasn't like she just picked chose, a random you know, country. closed her eyes and picked a spot on the map. Okay, so that's the basic facts of the story that concerns us today. And it just so everybody's clear, you know, we're going on what's available publicly. We don't know what happened inside their home. We don't know the conversations. We don't know the interactions. We just know what's available publicly. But as I said earlier, there is a new statute or a couple of statutes actually in California that might have some interesting impacts or applications in a case like this. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I feel like there are just so many issues, even without that statute, mm -hmm. that we ought to talk about some of those first. So first of all, Carrie had been named in Casey's advanced health care directive as his agent, but Jean did a bunch of things inconsistent with that anyway. So what happened there, Madison? What do you think went well, wrong there? She just 
she could. Uh, you know, medical professionals, hospitals, doctors, they're often willing just to deal with the spouse and allow the spouse to make decisions if there's no documentation. There's no, we don't have any facts saying that that healthcare directive was on file with those doctors or hospitals. And typically, they just want somebody to sign off on the decision. They just want, you know, to be able to pass that on to somebody else to make the decision. They're not too worried about who it is as long as it's a family member, and in this case, a spouse. So what? that's probably what happened here. Casey had a healthcare directive, but they didn't know about it. And because why would Jean provide a healthcare directive that names carry if she wants to make decisions for him? Right, right, yeah. right. It's very likely that the facility in Santa Monica did not know that there was a healthcare directive out there. And so they just were doing the best they could. His wife shows up. She seems to be taking good care of him. She's worried about him. They let her drive the bus. Yeah. And this uh, was 10 years ago. There probably weren't comprehensive electronic medical records uh, yes, like there are now. Like we have now. Yeah, that's very true. Okay. And so he had a healthcare directive. We are constantly expounding on the value of planning for your own incapacity and, and having a healthcare directive is part of that. And we do that in order to avoid this kind of thing, in order to prevent families from having to go through that conservatorship route, which this family actually had to do. And so one thing to say here is that sometimes even all of the planning in the world isn't going to keep the family out of court. So sometimes what we have to do, even though someone has a power of attorney, has a health care directive, has a living trust, we have to do a conservatorship anyway because they are doing things that are harmful to themselves, like writing big checks to charity and giving all their money away when they really can't to charity, yeah. <laughs> in quotation mark, when they really can't afford that. And so a conservatorship is an appropriate way to take their ability to write those checks away from them. And it's done to protect them. But in this case, we don't know why the judge granted Carrie the conservatorship, but it looks like you could infer that it was out of concern for his health and um, possibly in response to what Gene did and just scooping him up out of the nursing home and putting him in a car and driving away that the judge might have thought that I need to protect him from that kind of behavior. That's possibly not in his best interests um, yeah. health wise. And it's important to note that, and a lot of people ask this question when we do this in their estate plan, but that is why in your healthcare directive, you can nominate a conservator. They're like, why do I need a conservator if I'm doing this healthcare directive? And the difference is, you know, like you mentioned, Kirsten, is that the person named as your healthcare agent has the power to make decisions, but the conservator has the right to make a decision. So if you can make a decision on your deathbed, the doctor's going to go with your decision. And if your decision is to let your spouse that's not your healthcare agent make decisions, that let's say, if that were the case, they'll allow it if they deem that you have the capacity to say that. And they might allow you to make decisions for yourself that may or may not be in your best interest, but it's your decision. And so a conservatorship actually takes the conservatee's rights away and places them in the hands of the conservator. And so that the big difference there is you nominating someone to be your healthcare agent to make decisions if you're incapacitated, the conservatorship, they take those rights away from you. Right. So the, yeah. the agent can act for you, but a conservatorship is the only person now allowed to act for you. Your right. rights are taken away. So that is a big difference. That's yeah. kind of, it's a little abstract. It's a little hard to um, for clients to understand that. But yeah, I mean, in most situations, people aren't fighting this much in terms they might disagree with each other but they're not kidnapping you know, battling each other in court and kidnapping <laughs> each other in the middle of the night and in this case carrie was acting as casey's agent under his health care directive and she had the authority to make placement decisions but once she became the conservator jean would have no authority whatsoever should not have had any authority let me put it that way whatsoever because only carrie like you said is the only person who gets to make decisions so Right. But again, if places don't know there's a conservatorship. In right. Place. Yeah. So in a conservatorship, the judge issues letters of conservatorship, which is a document that Carrie would have presented to whatever healthcare facility. And then they would have had to say, I'm sorry, Jean, we can't listen to you anymore. We got to do whatever Carrie says. Carrie didn't have that opportunity. <laughs> so, you know, of course, neither a healthcare directive nor a conservatorship would do any good in a situation where the person is being hidden from the agent or the conservator. 
And also, I'm just going to say this case maybe is further complicated by the fact that we have two jurisdictions. The conservatorship took place in California, but Casey and Jean were in Washington when we finally caught up with them. Maybe Washington law is different. We don't know. But I think under California law, I think, and Madison, you might disagree, Carrie as the agent under his health care directive, unless he said something different, she would have been the one with legal priority and authority on the disposition of his remains. Yeah, I think yeah. so. And for sure as the conservator, if that <laughs> was the case, you know. Yeah. I mean, that part's a little questionable to me because, I mean, generally ends. conservatorship yeah. ends with death. So I don't really know, but in any event, there's the healthcare directive. I think they're on par with each other. Like it might be healthcare agent first and then the conservator, because typically conservatorships are granted when there isn't a healthcare directive and you yeah. need someone appointed to make those decisions. So either way, it was the same person. So in this case, yeah. 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 Okay. So now we said we were going to talk about this new legislation. So let's get into that. And so Madison is going to start by kind of walking through the legislation and she's got some comments to make along the way <laughs> as we go. So they have passed this new law. It went into effect January 1st of this year, 2023, in order to allow someone to make health care decisions in the event that there is no documentation in place. So this happens when like you have a friend who needs to go to the hospital and you take them to the hospital, but you don't have any authority. This kind of helps allow someone to have some authority. So it says section 4711 of the California probate code allows a patient to designate an adult as a surrogate to make healthcare decisions by personally informing the healthcare provider or facility caring for the patient. So when somebody is going into the hospital, like the emergency room or being admitted, they can tell them, tell the doctor verbally, I want Kirsten to be my surrogate while I'm in the hospital or whatever. So Casey could have told the skilled nursing facility in Santa Monica that he wanted Gene to be his healthcare agent even though he already had a healthcare directive naming Carrie. And we don't know if he was able to do that. Presumably that's in the stack of admissions paperwork that they do, you know, that you can fill out. So, I mean, even to this day, I'm sure it's still, that's still the case. So unless a period, a patient specifies a shorter period, the surrogate designation is effective only during the course of treatment or illness or during the stay in the healthcare institution when the designation is made or for 60 days, whichever period is shorter. So if you say, I want Kirsten to make my medical decisions while I'm in the hospital for this treatment, it would be for the length of treatment or 60 days, whichever comes first. If the patient has an agent under a healthcare directive, the surrogate designated by the patient does have priority over the agent until the designation expires. So at most the 60 days. But the designation of a surrogate doesn't revoke the healthcare directive unless the patient communicates the intention to revoke it which is interesting in itself because typically you have to revoke something in writing. So right. this, I mean, how would you know somebody revoked their healthcare directive? So that's, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. If they do it orally, that's yeah. probably not a revocation, uh, yeah. but the statute seemed to say that it is. Yeah. I don't know. Which is just going to result in some more court. More cases. litigation. Yeah. <laughs> so even if Casey did name Jean as a surrogate, once that expired after 60 days or less, Carrie would have been the default healthcare agent. And it's important to note that once Perry was appointed by the court to be Casey's conservator, the result would be different. He wouldn't even have had the legal authority to name a surrogate. Only Carrie could have done that, and she probably wouldn't have named Jean if she was going to court to fight her. Right. Okay. So um, there's a little more, and it's getting even more interesting. Also, probate code section 4712, the very next provision in the probate code, if a patient lacks capacity. So remember what Madison was talking about is... The patient himself, Casey in this case, says to his doctor, I want Gene to be my surrogate. But if he didn't have capacity, if the patient lacks capacity, then they lay out a hierarchy for who gets to make medical decisions. And number one is the patient's surrogate that they named previously. So if Casey had capacity, name Gene to be the surrogate while he's in the facility and then loses capacity, the facility still is going to honor that surrogacy as long as it exists. Second choice is the patient's agent under a health care directive. Third choice is a conservator, if the conservator has that power. So 
like I said, I think that means that if Casey had named Gene while he had capacity, but then lost capacity and before Kerry was appointed conservator, Gene would have been the one in charge until the authority expired, which would have been at most 60 days. Yeah. And it's important to note, even though the conservator is listed last on that priority list, if he had already been conserved prior to the hospitalization, that is essentially being deemed as incapacitated. So he wouldn't have been able to nominate anybody as a surrogate. He would have not had that right. Right. It's really interesting and sort of difficult for people to wrap their minds around that a conservator takes all the rights away. So the person who's conserved could not have said, I want Gene to be my surrogate. He That's couldn't. why there's been so much recent litigation about conservatorships and, you know, free Britney and all that good stuff that it's because you have no right, no right to renew your driver's license, no right to decide who you want to marry, all that kind of stuff that we deem as important liberties right. as individuals. Even though they're just trying to help somebody from not making bad decisions, it means they're not allowed to make any decisions. Right. It's, you'll see that a lot in the conservatorship news, so to speak. And so also if Casey had told the Santa Monica Skilled Nursing Facility that he wanted Jean to be a surrogate, it seems like that would have expired when she moved him out in the middle of the night. So one, because that is for that treatment. And so if you're taking him out against medical advice, treatment is over. And I'm sure taking him out in your own car, that's a discharge against medical advice typically. So one last part of the legislation that's important to note is that if a patient lacks the capacity to make a healthcare decision, but does not have a legally recognized healthcare decision maker, whether that's a named surrogate or an agent under a healthcare directive or a conservator, the healthcare provider or facility caring for the patient may choose a surrogate to make healthcare decisions on the patient's behalf. And they do have some guidelines for that. They can't just willy-nilly pick some they random pick person janitor. <laughs> yeah, to be your surrogate. So it says the patient surrogate shall be an adult who has demonstrated special care and concern for the patient, is familiar with the patient's personal values and beliefs to the extent known, and is reasonably available and willing to serve. Again, putting legal standards on medical issues, different conversations. A surrogate may be chosen from any of the following persons. So the first is spouse or domestic partner of the patient. Two, an adult child of the patient. Three, a parent of the patient. Four, an adult sibling of the patient, five, an adult grandchild of the patient, or six, an adult relative or close personal friend. And that's not a prioritized list. I just was reading off that there were six, um, but there's not, it's not a list of priority. Right. The facility or the, the doctor could choose any of these people, whichever one they think is appropriate. Yeah. So the statute in that regard, it sort of codifies what we know probably really happens anyway when a patient has no health care directive and they're incapacitated, the, the doctors really do want a decision maker in place. And so they will sort of informally tend to go along with that, I think, is what we understand. Yeah. If this law had been in effect in 2014, what do you think might have been a little different? Probably nothing. I mean, we don't know if Casey had the ability to name a surrogate. Uh, when he was admitted to the skilled nursing facility or if he even did. And we don't know how long he was there, but at most the appointment would last 60 days. She could have moved him, started the clock again, put him in another facility. We don't really know all the whereabouts until they land in Washington, knowing that he wasn't in the facility there. And if she was the only one who knew where he was, the medical staff would just go along with that. I mean, yeah. that's the thing is the statute would just validate what the staff would have done anyways. And maybe the statute is there to protect <laughs> The medical staff more than it is to protect individuals okay. getting care. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know. But uh, and if Casey had stated he wanted Jean to be a surrogate, even if Carrie had shown up with her health care directive for conservatorship documents, Jean would have had priority right. as long as while he was being treated or in that facility or 60 days. So the statute says health care decisions. So Carrie could probably still control placement, but that's not super clear. Yeah, it doesn't say what what that includes. So we don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, the argument could be made like exactly where you are is a health is a health like which hospital you choose to be treated at. It would be a medical decision. I mean, so it kind of, you know, it could be argued either way. probably. Yeah. Well, and I think under a health care directive, the generally speaking, the authority granted is placement as well. Yeah. But we don't know how the statute fits in. It's brand new. We don't know. Yeah. OK, so if the kids had shown up, and there was no health care directive and no conservatorship, 
that would have been interesting because how's the staff going to decide who the surrogate should be? <laughs> yeah, that would have been Terry Schiavo. Yeah, if case, yeah, exactly. That's the Terry Schiavo situation. Yeah. If Casey didn't have the capacity to say, now the doctors and the staff there have to pick somebody, but they don't have to pick somebody. That's the thing. The statute doesn't require them to pick a surrogate. It enables them to pick a surrogate. And so maybe they would have thrown their hands up and said, we are not getting into this. <laughs> We're going to treat this patient the way we think we have to, according to you know, our ethics, our Hippocratic oath, all of that stuff. So that might not have been consistent with what the family would have wanted. You know, doctors, I don't think they go ahead and withhold treatment unless somebody makes that decision for them. They're going to try and treat somebody. It would have forced them to go to court. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, and again, healthcare directive, conservatorship don't do any good when the patient is being hidden from everybody. Any other lessons we want to talk about from this case? I mean, there are a few lessons, I think. Sure. I mean, there was probably a reason that Casey named his daughter Carrie and not his wife of, you know, 30 years on his healthcare directive. And so yeah. maybe he was worried about her behavior, whether it was consistent or not. And, you know, usually spouses name each other. Occasionally we see that they don't. Most of the time their reasons are because one's health is failing and so they don't want to put that burden but occasionally they have reasons we maybe don't know about and don't, we don't want to ask. So there's probably some sort of reason why. I mean, he was the ill spouse, clearly. So there's that logic doesn't fit there. So right. there's probably some reason why he didn't name her. Yeah. And that's yeah, yeah. probably important. Yeah. And blend family, it just can be hard. You know, it's not uncommon, as I said in the beginning, for everyone to get along seemingly until the linchpin is pulled out, until the one parent who's kind of holding them all together, in this case, Casey, is gone. And he wasn't gone, gone like dead, but he was not participating anymore. I mean, we see it in all aspects of estate planning, but you know, in this case, communication is the most overlooked aspect of planning. And this does not only apply in blended family situations. <laughs> it can just apply where adult kids don't agree with their parents' care. You know, Jean may have acted unconventionally because she had been blindsided by his health care directive, you know, naming his daughter and not her as his spouse. She might have been upset, hurt, angry, and she couldn't take it out on him. So, you know, she's punishing the kids. That's speculation, you know, but we don't know. Who knows what makes someone crack? She was a caregiver, obviously. So we know that that can cause some cracks. And it's just important for everybody to get along. <laughs> Right. That point that you made is an important one, that yeah. she had been caring for him for years before all of this happened. And that all by itself is very stressful. That can make you maybe do some things that you wouldn't otherwise have done. But yeah, I think I'm just going to echo that point. It's communication. You know, maybe if Casey had sat her down 10 years earlier and said, look, this is what I put on my health care directive and here's the reason why and I'm doing it you know, maybe a little fiblet, maybe the truth. I'm doing it to spare you, whatever he had to say. But it's possible, yeah, that she didn't know that until we got to that point. Yeah, it's just never a good idea to blind sign anybody in any regard in the estate plan. It's one thing to keep someone in the dark. Like if you're don't, not telling your kids what you own, that's one thing. I mean, I understand that. Okay. But don't yeah. be like, oh, I'm disinheriting you or you have no part in my estate plan whatsoever, you know, because, but you don't tell them and they don't find out until it's too late. They don't get the closure at a minimum. And then you have the fighting. So it's important to have that, especially if it's your spouse too. Yeah. Like that would be very, you know. That important. would feel very hurtful to a spouse to yeah. discover something like this. But it's um, not like she was wife number five and they've been married for six months. You know, <laughs> it's not like that yeah. type of situation. They've been married for 30 plus years. Yeah, so. exactly. Okay, I'm going to look at questions from the audience. Okay. Would Carrie the conservator have legal authority in Washington to move Casey to another facility? Maybe. It depends. <laughs> it depends. Um, it depends. <laughs> We don't know what the laws are in Washington. Most likely, if the court in California had established jurisdiction over Casey, Casey. then the state of Washington would have allowed her. They would have, yeah. they would have, what do you want to call it, 
approved. They would have honored, honored yeah. it. Yeah, the conservatorship. I mean, so. yeah, that's the general law in our country is that the states honor the laws and the rulings and the court orders of other states, unless there's some reason why they shouldn't. But And I don't think, as much as we don't know about this case, the timeline does not indicate he was there long enough to establish any type of jurisdiction over him in the state of Washington. So right. they wouldn't have required, but you can move those conservatorships. But in this case, because it was a temporary and emergency situation, I'm sure they probably would have honored it. Would be my yeah. guess, best guess. Yeah, I th- I agree with you. Okay, another question: Would any of the people with legal authority have the power to keep the other family members away from Casey? I think so. I mean, if that person has medical decision making powers, they can keep anybody away from the patient. Typically, obviously, a conservatorship would have the highest rank typically in our minds, but a healthcare directive certainly says that the agent gets to make decisions. Yeah, and I I think that would be, if he's in a facility especially, that they would be controlling who can visit him and for how long and, and those kinds of things. That's yeah. not to say that a decision like that would go over <laughs> and right. unchallenged. That might generate its own little bit of litigation, but, but technically I think they probably could, yeah. Yeah, and I don't think, uh, like, it's a surrogacy law where you can name someone to be a surrogate, that doesn't quite enumerate the powers like a healthcare directive or the conservatorship does. So I don't know the answer to that one, but presumably they would. I mean, a medical decision is a medical decision. So having somebody there can cause stress that can cause an exacerbated health condition. So I imagine it would be the same case. We just don't, like it's new legislation. We don't have all that laid out. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's the end of our audience questions. So Madison, that was fun. <laughs> it was chaotic. That's for sure. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's convoluted. Listen twice <laughs> to this episode. <laughs> there was just a lot going on. And there was like a 48 hours interview with both Jean and Carrie. And it's just insane. So I mean, yeah, I'll watch if you want to know more, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, you just be then you'll feel better about your family. After you listen to that. That is a good point. If you need to feel a lot better about your stepmom, <laughs> watch that show. Okay. Thank you, Madison. That was a really fun conversation. And thank you all for listening and watching. And we look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Absolute Trust Talk Live. If you enjoyed listening in, then don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you may listen by searching Absolute Trust Talk. While you're there, we would also love for you to leave us a review. And then why not share your favorite episodes with family, friends, or colleagues too? You can find all of our shows and corresponding show notes by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. You'll also find a variety of other free resources, including our eBooks, videos, blogs, presentations, and more. If you need help with your estate planning or administration, we also offer a free discovery call to help get the process started. You can find more information on booking your session by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com slash scheduling. Don't forget to keep an eye out for our next live episode in two weeks. If you join us for the broadcast, you can submit questions during the show. But if not, don't worry. You can always get in touch with us by sending a quick message to info at AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you soon. This podcast is not meant to take place of legal advice from an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you do have a legal question or issue, please consult with an attorney.